I have had several, I'll say, conversations with people about numbers in the Bible, which I love and adore, uh, but like they would take, like up here on the screen, Revelation 17, they would take the number 17 and they would say, uh, well, 1 plus 7 is 8. So the number 17 is really a secret way of saying the number 8. And I'm going, you know, math doesn't work that way. If, if somebody at McDonald's tried to give you your change that way, okay, let's say, well, Jay, both these guys used to work at Hardy's. So... If they owed me 35 cents in change and they handed me 8 cents, I would say, where's the rest of my change? Well, 3 and 5 is 8. I'd be walking inside going, you know what, I hate to make a big scene about 35 cents, but it's my 35 cents. And, uh, and I, I just want to say to everybody publicly, I've had more than one person um, do this to try to prove something from the Bible, and I, I just want to I just want to encourage you to uh, try something different, okay? Because that's not really God is the one who invented math, Amen. And God is the one we didn't nobody no council anywhere sat down and determined how math was going to work. Nobody did. Because it's always, a, it's a universal, it's called an axiom. It doesn't need any proof whatsoever that if, if, if in the old days I had eight pearls and you were going to charge me three pearls for, give, for uh, 20 sheep that I wanted to buy from you, then it's very simple. I count out three pearls, you count out 20 sheep. Don't say, well, 20 is 2 plus 0. So I don't know. I didn't pay, I didn't pay for two sheep. I paid for 20 sheep. No, no council of man ever sat down and organized math the way it is. It just is, okay? Th 20 is 20. Whether it's 10 of this and 10 of that, or 9 of this and 11 of that, it's, it's 20, okay? Well, I've got eight pearls, Jack, okay? I am rich. But anyway, I, I just want to encourage people, do math the right way, okay? There's no, there's no, let me say this, God does not hide things in some mystical, unruly way. He says things plainly. Paul said we use great plainness of speech, not as Moses, uh, the prophet was told to write it, make it plain on tables, that he may run that readeth it. And um, so make it plain and make it simple and make it understanding. Don't make it complicated. Make it simple so that everybody can follow it. All right? All right. Now, Revelation 17. Now, having said all that, let me tell you, let me introduce you to the woman who does not speak plainly. Um, I will say that. Um, one of the directions that I have, I've got several things now that I think I will talk about this weekend for homecoming. Um, I've been working on a presentation called The Fakers. And um, it's based upon... Um, my fascination, I guess it's, it started out my fascination with how um, magicians make things disappear. I've always just, fasc it's fascinated me. 
how magicians do their do their things, how they do card tricks, and I know a few card tricks and so on. Um, but that's always fascinated me. And um, when Harry Houdini, when he lost his mother, um, they were, of course, they were Jewish, and um, his father, um, Eric, his father, Rabbi Weiss, um, he was a Jewish rabbi, immigrant to America, and uh, they were poor because his father wouldn't learn English. And the synagogue kept telling him, you know, hey, you need to learn English, you know, we'll use you as our rabbi. But he, he just wouldn't do it or couldn't do it or whatever. Uh, but Eric, Eric Weiss was his name, and he grew up in this Jewish uh, family learning mysticism at Kabbalah, basically. Um, and um, his favorite uh, magician was the great Houdin, which was a French magician. And so when his mother called him Eric, she didn't say Eric, she said Ari. Uh, so like Harry. So that's where he got Harry Houdini from. But anyway, when his mother died, she was very close to him and he to her. And so he spent a lot of time trying to get in touch with his mother after she died because he felt like he, she went into the spirit world and he could contact her and and you know want to know how she's doing and and so on and um, so he was started going to these fortune tellers and these mediums that were popping up all around the turn of the century uh, from the early 18 late 1800s early 1900s and they were they were everywhere and people were just fascinated by this because these uh, you've heard of parlor tricks that phrase parlor tricks comes from these um, these seances and things like that that were being held because all of a sudden there would be some sort of ghost thing appear uh, a, a trumpet would be seen floating in midair blowing uh, you know chairs moving in the room and things like that well Houdini knew enough about magic to know how stuff works. And so he's going to seances and he sees them do these same tricks all the time. And he's like, oh, come on. And he spent his life uh, trying to find someone who could actually speak beyond the veil into the spirit realm to bring his mother back so he could see her one last time or whatever and and failed and him and his wife Bess had the same they would they would do they would go and bust up these seances because all of a sudden Harry would I don't know how he did it but he would always show everybody in the room how everything was done and all of a sudden these people running these seances man word got around don't let Houdini in whatever you do because he was busting these places wide open. Police were arresting some of them for running, you know, con games and taking money from people. And uh, but anyway, him and Bess, his wife, they had worked out a thing to where they were going to whoever died first, they would they would reach out October 31st, the next Halloween in a certain way with a secret message so that they would know it was them. And when Houdini died, his wife, Bess, went and she, the next Halloween, tried to con. There was somebody that came up and said, I know I can get in touch with him. You know, I promise you I can. And they didn't know that they had a secret code worked out between them. And when Bess goes to this seance and they ask, you know, Harry Houdini, what's the secret word? And this lady comes up with something and Bess goes, it's not him. I know it's not. She spent the rest of her life every year. Trying to get in touch with him. And that's sad. So anyway, um, those con games are still being played. They are being played in the seance world, the psychic world. And I've got a whole deal to show you on um, a psychic named James Van Pra who supposedly was going to help um, Sean Hornbeck's parents 
find out where he was. And I found the, uh, the show that they did with this psychic, James Van Pra, and I, and I wrote down every prediction that Van Pra said. And of course, we know now what happened to Sean Hornbeck. We know. We know all the details. We know everything that happened because Hornbeck was the one. There was one thing that Van Pra got right. He said, I believe he's still alive. Now, I don't know if that was something that Van Pra said all the time. Be, boy, here I am doing my spiel for homecoming. But anyway, he said, I, I don't know if that was something that he did all the time because uh, I, I think that if he would say, I think Sean is dead, then he as a psychic then should have had the ability to get in contact with Sean. Reach beyond the grave, in other words. So I think one of his main methods was to say about every kid or every whatever, uh, yeah, I think he's still alive. I'm getting that he's still alive. Okay, and you can just see the look on his mother's face. She's like, oh. Okay, and of course that was, and that was the one thing that he got right. Uh, everything else that he said was totally wrong. And according to the Bible, how many times you got to be wrong? Okay. And, but people believed it. And now there is a magician by the name of James Randi. He's been doing this for years. He's the one that caught Peter Popoff, uh, a supposed faith healer, uh, exposed him on national television uh, as being a fake. And, uh, and Popoff had to file for bankruptcy, but he's back at it again. He's doing it again. And these people are, yeah, they're, they're frauds. They're fakes. Um, and so it's being done in the, in the faith healing movement. It's being done in the word of, I'm getting words of knowledge from God, that movement. It's being done in the uh, God and country movement because the, peop, the men and women who are leading, and this is where I'm really, really uh, very discouraged is that the people who are leading the charge to get Trump reelected, all of them are part of this new apostolic reformation movement and they believe that they are latter-day prophets and get this, every one of them is on recorded YouTube videos saying Trump will win the 2020 election. Guaranteed, guaranteed. Several of them saying, God has told me. God has told me this. Okay? Well, when it doesn't work out, then you have to start coming up with reasons why God was wrong. Okay? And, but the, and the bad thing is, is that the people who sent money to these fraud experts should have known better after the inauguration they should have known better by now they should have known better that he didn't win okay or if he did win he didn't make it into the white house and i, I don't know if youtube will let me say this but that's the thing is they're lying still to these people and they're raking in millions and millions of dollars and i won't be part of that yes ma'am Y2K, yes ma'am. Exactly. Yeah. All right, Revelation 17. Th this lady here is the mother of all secrets and mysteries and lies and cover-ups and everything else. Uh, what is what is encryption? Somebody explain the word encryption. What does that word mean? Okay, that's uh, you said it right. Hidden or locked away. In in electronics, if I send an encrypted email, what does that mean? Okay, 
the, the email, if you tried to read the email, it would be just a bunch of garbled things on a page, okay? You would need the key to unlock the code to uh, turn that into legible words, okay? Do you know where the word encryption comes from? What'd you say? Yes, exactly. Crypt. Crypt. Something is locked up and hidden in a crypt. A secret, a mystery is buried in a crypt somewhere, a tomb. And it, the whole idea of, of encryption basically stems from this secret doctrine that has been kept secret by all these occultists throughout thousands of years and they, they have encrypted it in ways to where if you just look at a series of symbols without having the key, you would never be able to understand the symbols. Well, I have found that here's the key. Okay? And it's fun now to go and unlock. Oh, look at that. I can unlock it. I can unlock that too. All right. Anyway, I got to get busy here. Revelation 17 verse 1. Let's go to the Lord in prayer so I can get serious, all right? Father, we just ask you, God, to uh, show us uh, your, your will, your love for us. Manifest tonight, uh, Father, uh, the great things that are contained in your word. And Lord, there, there really is no secret to what's in this book. It's just that we read it and we believe it. And God, you'll give us understanding, you'll give us knowledge, uh, you'll give us counsel, You'll give us wisdom, Lord, from the wonderful pages of this book. So, Father, just open up our eyes, Lord, and help us to understand this mystery of this probably greatest of all mysteries, at least in our days, of this woman and the beast that carries her. And, Lord, we just ask God that as time goes on and we see things happening in this world, Lord, that we turn back to the pages of the Bible and we find therein the key that does unlock all of the encrypted secret things that so many people are trying to keep, keep hidden. Bless our eyes and our ears and, and bless the eyes and ears of our heart, Father, that we may have pure knowledge from you, we ask in Jesus' name, and amen. Now, let me, now in keeping with this, boy, I can't get off this subject. In keeping with this, uh, if you have been following the news in the past several days, more and more military and former uh, intelligence people are testifying before congressional committees about UAPs, unknown aerial phenomenon, in other words, UFOs. They have been testifying and telling the things that they know now because the path has been cleared for them to be able to say these things in public without fear of reprisal or fear of losing their pension or fear of losing their life. Okay? One of the recent things that came out was that I think this was at Wright-Patterson. I may have the location wrong, but it was at one of these top air bases that we have in our country uh, and this happened um, I'm gonna say in in this century I know pretty I'm pretty sure it happened uh, within the last 20 years but let's see here uh, all right, we got to pray for somebody named Tony all right so anyway um, but what happened was all of a sudden, there was this appearance of a, it was described as the size of a football field, at least 100 yards in size, cube that came right over the top of the base. It hovered there silent for 45 seconds and then darted off. And it wasn't just a one-time event. This happened over a series of several days where this thing would show up. At times, it seemed like it was interested in some of the security guards 
that were there at the base because it would approach them. And whatever, 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 we don't know anything beyond that. And then it was gone. I'm reasonably sure that more than likely somebody's got a picture of this somewhere tucked away. Uh, I don't know that positive. But I would, that's what I would say. Uh, that just came out this weekend. So my question is, do you, do you really think that our government has a secret organization within the vast bureaucracy of the United States federal government that there is a secret operative organization operating without government or congressional oversight receiving billions and billions of dollars in funding each year that has secrets about UFOs, unknown aerial phenomenon, and intelligent life outside of this world, do you think that such an organization exists? I would say without a doubt, yes, and I would say I know who's helping them keep the secrets. No. Revelation 17, think Bible. There came one of the seven angels which had the seven vials and talked with me saying unto me, come hither. I will show unto thee the judgment of the great whore that sitteth upon many waters with whom the kings of the earth have committed fornication. And the inhabitants of the earth have been made drunk with the wine of her fornication. So he carried me away in the spirit into the wilderness. And I saw a woman sit upon a scarlet colored beast full of names of blasphemy, having seven heads and ten horns. The woman was arrayed in purple and scarlet color. And understand that um, things like dyes of purple, things that dyed clothing purple and scarlet, things like that, were not easy to come by as they are now. Okay? So to have colorful clothing like this, uh, came at a great cost. Um, but anyway, and it's eye candy. It is. It's meant to draw and attract the eyes. Uh, if you go back and look at the time when Hollywood first started using color films, boy, they blasted the color, didn't they? The Wizard of Oz, the Ten Commandments, I mean, they just blasted you with colors. They just like overdid the color thing because it was the first time they were using it. And they thought, we're, we're really going to take advantage of this. And it just, it just blares out in color. But anyway, that's what's going on here. Uh, she was arrayed in purple and scarlet color, decked with gold and precious stones and pearls, having a golden cup in her hand full of abominations and filthiness of her forn fornication, and upon her forehead was the name written, Mystery, Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots, an abomination to the earth. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13 words that are all in capitals. That means something. Uh, 13 is a number related to rebellion. Uh, it's related to wickedness. It's related to uh, the difference between two types of love where you have God's pure love, the phrase love of God is mentioned 13 times in the King James Bible. And when you have 12 disciples walking around with Jesus, their Lord, who is God's love gift to mankind, you have 13 people. He's the 13th one um, among the 12 disciples. And he is the one upon you know whom he said, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. God gave Christ to the world unconditionally. And his love was given to the world unconditionally. It didn't, he wasn't just um, giving Jesus over to the people who deserved him. He was giving Jesus over to the people who didn't deserve him. One of the first things that I ever ran into in differences between Bibles was um, I had uh, I don't remember where I got it maybe the school library uh, my high school library but I got a copy of the Catholic Bible 
And I was just comparing different verses. And one of the verses that I, first verses that I saw a big difference in was, is when the angels were announcing the birth of Christ. And in the King James, uh, it says, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth, peace, goodwill toward men. But in the Catholic, I think it was the douay Reims Bible, in the Catholic Bible, it said, uh, Glory to God in the highest, uh, and on earth, peace to men of goodwill. In other words, peace to good people, but not to everybody. And the difference being in the King James, peace and goodwill toward men. And then all you have to do is be human, and God will love you, and offer Christ unconditionally to you. But, and so that is... God's part of the number 13. Mystery Babylon's part is, I will love you if... And you can fill in the blank with whatever you want. I will love you if you meet certain qualifications or if you do this for me or if you can get me this job or if um, whatever... Are there women who have worked their way up to the top in business and corporations in a, I will say, in a loose fashion? You bet there is. Are there women who have gotten top roles in films that way? Yes. It's not all Harvey Weinstein's fault. Okay, he's the guy, he's the movie producer who went to prison because basically... You had to perform or you didn't get a job with him. And um, so that happens. So that kind of love there is harlot love. If you pay me, I will love you. If you give me this, uh, I can love you for an hour. I can love you for three hours. I can love you for days on end if you want, as long as you got the money. And that's her love. Mystery Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots and abominations of the earth. And I saw the woman drunken with the blood of the saints. And we're going to see later that it's not just the blood of the saints, it's the blood of everybody that's slain. And, and with the blood of the martyrs of Jesus. And when I saw her, I wondered with great admiration. And um, I, I am thinking and praying seriously this weekend about uh, dealing with this issue, this movie that has been made. Um, uh, I... I should probably see it. I don't know that I want to. Uh, but in order to get, I guess, a good idea of what it really is and what, what they're really talking about. Um, and I've already dealt with the issue of can blood make you drunk? Yes, absolutely. It's proven. It's a known thing. Um, and so my thing is if physical blood makes you physically drunk, is there spiritual blood? Yeah, there's Christ. Christ's blood uh, is divine blood. It is spiritual blood. Um, and notice that she's drunk with the blood of the martyrs of Jesus. How is it, if this is one particular woman, how can she be drunk with the blood of every martyr of Jesus Christ? So I think we're dealing with the spiritual realm as well. I don't know yet. I have to study it. I have to look into it more. But that's the angle that I may go in this weekend. So y'all pray for me, okay? A lot of things happening right now that uh, need to be addressed. And uh, uh, sometimes it overwhelms me. And when I get busy with other things, home life and so on like that, it just, it really, yeah, it gets to me. So y'all pray for me, okay? Now, in verse 7, the angel said unto me, Wherefore didst thou marvel? Oh, let me go back here. The first word on her name is mystery. Not that she reveals mysteries. She keeps them hidden from mankind. So that's why I said, uh, if, if there is... Uh, an organization operating within the bureaucracy of the United States of America without congressional oversight, and yet 
They get billions and billions of dollars in funding. The, the, the question is, what are they hiding? And what is the spirit behind what they're hiding? What is the spirit? John Fitzgerald Kennedy made a speech. You can find this on YouTube against secret societies. Here is this liberal Democrat uh, who's, who's born with a silver spoon in his mouth, never worked, a, I won't say never worked a day in his life. If you've ever looked at uh, the story of PT-109, you know that Jack Kennedy, at least in, in the war, was, a re was real. Okay, because he did a pretty interesting, he was a war hero. But aside from that, uh, here is this New England liberal who is making a speech saying secret organizations and secret societies have no place whatsoever in a truly democratic society. The very notion of secrecy and no oversight is repugnant to those who want to live free. And I'm like, that's not bad. That's not bad. Okay. So anyway, her name is mystery. So any secret, any kind of uh, encryption, any kind of, uh, and I'm talking about as far as philosophies and religion goes. And things concerning what is going to happen in the last days. Her job is to always confuse the masses. Because if you got everybody confused, there can be no consensus on what is going to happen. And how many different viewpoints are there on the book of Revelation? About as many people as ever read the book of Revelation. And uh, so I think at least in some part, her spirit has something to do with that. All right. Now, verse seven. And no, I didn't say that her spirit helped write the Bible. So don't anybody put words in my mouth. Verse seven. The angel said unto me, wherefore didst thou marvel? I will tell thee the mystery. Boom. There it is. Every time you have a mystery, you got God coming along saying, oh, I'll show you what it is. It's easy. Jeremiah 30, read that up there on the screen. Call unto me and I will answer thee and show thee great and mighty things which thou knowest not. And God means it. You ask, he'll give, okay? I will tell thee the mystery of the woman and the beast that carrieth her, which hath the seven heads and ten horns. The beast that thou sawest was and is not. Now again, believe your Bible first. Ask questions later. Okay? Don't try. The worst thing you can do is to try to retranslate in order to make it make sense. Let God let it make sense. Let God do that. And he will. The beast that thou sawest was and is not. And shall... Ascend out of the bottomless pit and we know from uh, Job 10 that that's the place without any order Where light is as darkness. So it, it is a place of pure chaos So uh, Damon you're gonna like this one ordo ab chao. you ever run across that term? Okay He and I were talking at lunch is why I'm picking him out tonight because he has studied he, he sounds like his, his mind works like mine. I want to know what that is. Okay. So ordo ab chao. Order, ordo means order. Ab means from. Chao is where we get the word chaos. However, it is a Greek word for the abyss, the bottomless pit. So, order from the pit, the bottomless pit, the abyss, okay? The chao, order from where the chaos is. Who remembers 
Get Smart. Remember that show? Don, um, Don Adams uh, and Agent 99. We never knew her name. She was just 99. And he walks through all these doors, you know, layer upon, those are layers, by the way, levels. And um, at the end, which direction does he go? When he gets to the very last phone booth, at the end of this long corridor with all these doors opening, and he makes a, picks up the phone, and says something, hangs the phone up, what happens to him right after that? What happened, Roy? He fell down, didn't he? Now, am I making too much of this? I don't know. The organization that he worked for was called Control. The organization that they worked against was called what? Chaos! With a K. Control was with a K and chaos was with a K. Okay? <laughs> anyway, um, I, I used to love that show. That's why I know so much about it. But any, anyway... Uh, what was I? What the, she, he, he shall ascend out of the bottomless pit. That's why I said that. Verse 8. And go into perdition. Perdition is total destruction. It is, uh, I, I believe it is the lake of fire. I could be wrong. He, he ascends out of the pit. He, he is what, uh, what we say out of the frying pan into the fire. Okay. He's going out of the bottomless pit. But he's going to go into perdition. God, I think God here is telling us he's not going to rule and reign forever. He's not going to take control of everything. He's not going to be this long-term king. He is going to go into perdition. And they that dwell on the earth shall wonder whose names were not written in the book of life from the foundation of the world when they behold the beast that was and is not and yet is. Now, again, that's one of those things there where you believe the Bible first and then you ask questions. Because how can something, and I've, I've said this before so many times, but how can something be and is not and yet it is? How can something not be but be? Even Shakespeare said it, to be or not to be. Not both, to be and not to be. Okay, that's a bigger question. But the idea is that he is an enigma of all enigmas. He, of course the world is going to wonder after him. Because he comes from a place where light and darkness are the same thing. He comes from a place of absolute total chaos, total disorder, total disarray. That's where he comes from. Now, let me just kind of speculate a little bit, okay? In my lifetime, I was born, Sister Betty, way back in 1966, okay? Way back in them days. I still remember going to restaurants where a waiter with a little white cap sideways and a white button-down shirt with a black bow tie, long sleeve shirt and white pants. Huh? Something, I don't know what that means. But anyway... Um, were they still served that way? Okay, it, it was it was like something out of the fifties. I can st now that was we were on the tail end of that going away because McDonald's had was gearing up and taking over. But anyway, um, that's one of my early remembrances. And in my lifetime, what was Sister Betty? You, uh, I am just guessing that you were around at that time. The people in your generation watching the Beatles come over from England to America. One of the first things that American commentators said about the Beatles was their long shaggy hair. Now when they first came over here, I think that was what, 63? We, they, they would we would not characterize their hair as long. 
but to American standards, it was. Okay? And then it got longer. And, but what they brought over here to this country in the form of their look had an effect on this entire nation. And now all of a sudden, boys are wanting their hair to grow. They don't want to conform and things to be in order. They want to rebel against what's normal. What spirit is that? That's his spirit. That's the beast and a Christ spirit because he comes from a, a realm of disorder, chaos, confusion, things out of order. And, and so between the years of 1963 and 1969, just six years, we go from boys wearing buzz cuts to school to Woodstock. In just six years, girls went from not just being made to wear dresses to school, wanting to wear dresses to school, to Woodstock where you couldn't even get them to wear pants and shirts. See what I'm saying? Something happened in this country. A spirit was released in this country and around the world, and I'm not blaming the Beatles, but they were part of it. That spirit, we already know that they were involved in the occult. We already know that. We already know that Aleister Crowley was a influence in their philosophies. We already know that. So here they come and they're breaking the rules. I remember, in fact, you can probably find this on YouTube. Um, Elvis Presley, one of his early, early appearances with Ed Sullivan. Ed Sullivan brings him out on the stage. This is where Ed Sullivan got mad at him. Ed Sullivan brings Elvis out. And uh, Elvis, uh, I don't think he had, maybe he did. I don't know. I don't, can't remember if he was already out of the army or what. But Sullivan takes Elvis out. He's got his arm around him. And he says to the audience and to the whole country, I want everybody to know this is a good, decent young man for American, you know, values. By that time, Elvis was already having a relationship with his, uh, who married, not Lisa Marie, that was her daughter, Priscilla. He was already having a relationship with Priscilla, who was, when when Elvis was stationed in Germany, he was the commanding officer's daughter was Priscilla, and she was only 14 years old at the time. So here is Elvis being presented to the country as a decent young man, but he's not. And there was never anything decent about Elvis in his lifestyle. Never. Uh, I don't know. But anyway, so we have this disorder coming up out of the pit. We can already, and what did John say? John said the spirit of Antichrist is already at work. And so we start seeing it in this country, in, in the standards, the values, the norms that we have. Uh, and now we're living in a time now when people can't even figure out what gender they want to be tomorrow. And so this is, this is chaos, pure and simple. And Mystery Babylon, remember, she, she rides this beast. And so um, in verse 9, and here is the mind which hath wisdom. The seven heads are seven mountains on which the woman sitteth. Now, some have said, and I'm going I'm to finish these verses and we'll, we'll cut it off tonight. Some have noted that in Rome, there are seven, Rome has always been known as the city on seven hills. And one of the hills is um, the Mount Vaticanus or whatever. It's where the Vatican is right now. And there are six other high points in the city of Rome. 
And uh, more than likely, at, at some time or another, they had various probably pagan temples on there because that's where they put them. They put them on high places, on hills. Uh, and so some have said at, that this obviously is a reference. Our, our Baptist forefathers preached that this was Rome the, and the church of Rome, who is the harlot. She's the harlot church. She is Babylon. And um, she sits on the seven hills, and this, these seven hills are the seven hills of Rome, and so on. And, and there may be a, a, a partial fulfillment, a, a partial understanding of that, in other words. A partial connection. But mountains represent uh, other things in the Bible. Number one, they represent kingdoms. Uh, the mountain of the Lord's house shall be established. And that's going to be during the thousand year reign of Christ. Um, Mount Sinai was the mountain of God. And it's where God came down and met uh, the Israelites and gave them his fiery law and so on. Uh, mountains are also a picture of the heavens. Because where, where do mountains reach they reach the sky they reach into the heavens um, so you have mountains representing the heavens what do valleys represent sure they do hell uh, the valley of Megiddo is Armageddon it is the valley of Megiddo that's and that's where the final battle is going to take place the plain of Shinar is where the city called Babel was first built. It was in a low plain, a valley, okay? And that right there tells you something. So you have the mountain of God. Here, this is heaven, a mountain, mountaintop. And then you have the valley down below, which is where Babel sits. And you have these opposites in the Bible. One showing you one thing, another showing you another. Now this woman sits on seven of those. And uh, I don't have the law here in front of me, um, but obviously this woman is unclean. And I think then the law would apply to this woman because of her uncleanness. The law said that when a woman was in her manner, that she was unclean for a certain period of time, and that the, her clothing was unclean and every place that she sat was unclean and it had to go through a a washing process purification process a certain number of days and so on we we look at that now and we think that well that's that's just simple uh sanitary conditions you you cleanse things with water to wash bacteria away and uh that way you kill germs and so on and we spray things down with lysol to clean things up and so on, but I think it also means more than I think represents a spiritual uncleanness. And so the woman herself would be unclean and everything that she sat on would be unclean. So this woman sitting on these seven mountains, which the Bible says are, let's see, where was that? Um, here's the mind that hath wisdom, the sev seven heads are seven mountains on which the woman sitteth. So she has made these mountains unclean and there are seven kings. Now, scholars have tried and tried and tried and tried and tried to fit various people from, from history as being these kings. Um, I've, I've, heard read, I've read things about Nero Caesar being one of them. Um, I can't remember everything that I've ever read or heard about who these seven kings are. Um, but I think that they are not earthly kings. I think they are spirit kings. Uh, five, and five are fallen. One is and the other is not yet come. And when he cometh, he must continue a short space. Now, I don't understand that, but I believe it. I'll know it when I see it and the beast that was and is not and he is 
the eighth, and is of the seven. Now, somebody introduced an idea to me that I thought, wow, that's pretty good. And I like it. Because it means that somebody else is out there reading the Bible, thinking Bible. Because I think they heard me say that this beast is the eighth. And I may have said, and he is one of the seven. Uh, apparently, he is one of the seven kings that have previously showed up. But this guy said, what if he's not one of them? He is of those seven. In other words, he derives from all seven of them. And now that makes sense because we have a beast with one body and seven heads. And these seven heads all make up this one body of the beast. And the beast himself is the eighth and he's of all seven of these. Now, we live in the day where genetic modification is part of life now. And is it possible, I'll just put it to you this way, is it possible for a child to be born with seven different parents? Of course it is. And isn't that confusion? Happy Father's Day. Wouldn't you hate to have to write seven Father's Day cards with seven $50 Home Depot cards to all seven of your dads? Okay? Seven kings, five or five. But he is the eighth and is of the seven and goeth into perdition. And the ten horns which thou sawest are ten kings, which have received no kingdom as yet, but received power as kings one hour with the beast. These have one mind and shall give their power and strength unto the beast. These shall make war with the lamb and the lamb shall overcome them for he is the Lord of lords and king of kings. And they that are with him are called and chosen and faithful. And I'll get into, I'm about to lose my voice and I'll get into more uh, about what I think about verse uh, 12, 13 and 14 uh, next Sunday night because there's a little teaching in here I like. But I want to give it its give it its due space. All right, let's stand.